in Gyanwapi case. We will be discussing about Gyanwapi case, uh, Places of Worship Act and Work of Board Act. These three will be the point of discussion today and uh, uh, there will be question answer session as usual. We are, as usual, we are planning for a, a two hour session. The first hour is dedicated for the for explaining the subject and the second hour is for question answers like we usually do this program is also being uh, screen recorded and will be uploaded to our uh, uh, our uh, youtube channel uh, satyamajay day clubhouse it's been pinned on top those who have in uh, those who have in uh, subscribed to our channel kindly subscribe it share it with your family and uh, friends those who are coming up for asking the questions, ask the questions in a concise manner to the point, probably take about 30 seconds or uh, a minute. And once you ask the question, you get your answer. After that, we will be sending you back to the audience. Now, this is something that we usually do and that will be followed today also. Those who are down there, uh, please ping your followers, let uh, more people know. We understand that this timing is uh, a bit difficult, but uh, since actually Vishnu Shankar Jain is quite busy, uh, we don't have a much of any option but to actually choose this time. He will be joining shortly. Those who are there in the audience, kindly uh, ping your followers, let uh, more people join. And I would like to ask actually if anybody require translation today, uh, please let me know in the, in, the, in the group chat. Uh, Vishnu sir, Namaste. Welcome to your channel. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. So our guest is here. Uh, Vidya ji, actually you can give the introduction yeah. and we'll go from there. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, namaste and a very good early evening or rather late afternoon to everyone here. First and foremost, Ravi, thank you once again for another wonderful opportunity to introduce our main guest for today, who is none other than our very own Sri Vishnu Shankar Jain, Advocate Supreme Court. Vish son of the well-known senior supreme advocate Shri Hari Shankar Jain, who had represented the Hindu Mahasabha in the Ram Janma Bhumi Babri Masjid case, as well as he was a litigator and attorney in at least 12 cases involving Hindu Jain deities. Along with the Gyanwapi case, there are over 110 such disputed cases in which the father and son duo are fighting on behalf of the Hindus. This includes Mathura's Krishna Janmabhumi Shahi Idgah case, the Kutub, Min Kutub Minar complex dispute, the Lakshman Tila Tilewali Masjid case of Lucknow, the Tejo Mahalai versus Taj Mahal case Agra, the Kuwat ul Islam Mosque case, the Palghar Sadhu murder case, the Adi Vishweshwar restoration case Varanasi, the petition challenging the constitutional validity of the Wakaf Act. Petition challenging the Places of Worship Act 1991, which was brought into effect by the Congress government. The writ petition in 2019 challenging the budgetary allocation of Rs 4,700 crores to run the schemes in favour of the so-called minorities. That is, under this scheme, special minority grant was given to Wakaf properties as well as madrasas. Writ petition in 2018 challenging the constitutional validity of the Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir 1957 and along with these several other cases too. Vishnuji is the spokesperson for the Hindu Justice Front. He began his practice in the case of Sri Ramajanma Bhumi in Ayodhya challenging the 2010 verdict of the High Court of Allahabad. He ably helped his father Sri Hari Shankarji in the above matter. In 2016, he passed the exam 
for the position of, a, of advocate in the Supreme Court and registered his first appearance in the Supreme Court in the case of Sri Ramajanma Bhumi in Ayodhya in 2016. Vishnuji has taken it upon himself to challenge the legitimacy of the several disputed mosques as he believes that several of these Islamic houses of worship were built by demolishing Hindu temples. Vishnuji's petitions are based on the findings of Sri Jadunath Sarkar, who was a prominent historian of the 20th century. Vishnu Shankarji is one person who never forgets to mention how he and his family, especially his father, Sri Hari Shankarji, feel happy to have been able to do the sort of work that they do. Clearly, the father and son duo are determined men on a dharmic mission, taking up cases and standing up for the Hindu cause. So, with a heart full of pride and gratitude, I welcome you, sir, Sri Vishnu Shankar Jain, to please come forward and enlighten us about your mission and achievements. Thank you so much for joining us. Vishnuji, the mic is yours. And Ravi, thank you once again for this opportunity. A very good afternoon to all of you. I hope I am audible and clear. Yes, sir. Yes. Very sir. clear. <clears throat> so, today the issue which uh, I want to bring here for discussion is uh, pertaining to the Gyanvyapi temple complex case, the validity of the fact as well as the places of worship act and what is the interplay and interconnection between the Gyanvyapi case, the Vaf act and the places of worship act. See if we, if we analyze the facts of Gyanvyapi case uh it's not just uh, as uh, as i was introduced it's not just that we are fighting for places of worship for creating any kind of dispute or any kind of disharmony in the society our purpose is that when someone goes through and deeply research in uh, the spiritual part of hindu law when someone research uh, at the micro level about the uh, legal aspects of the Hindu law, it will be very eminent and it will be very clear that uh, it's a very settled proposition of Hindu law that once a property vests in the deity, once you dedicate a property to the deity or to the God or to, to the Almighty, till the end of the time that property remains to be deity's property. And this proposition of law was dealt extensively in Ram Janbhumi case also from uh, and it is a reported judgment 2021 SCC page 1 where Supreme Court has very categorically said and given examples of ship also where ship is not a living entity but it is a juristic person. Those examples were given where company is not a living entity but it's a juristic person it can sue it can be sued. In the same way, Hindu deity has been given a personality of a juristic person. A suit can be filed on behalf of the deity. A suit can be filed against the deity. And Hindu deity is subject to tax also. So that's the difference between the concept and theme of Hindu law with that perspective of a mosque or a church. And that's why... Uh, if you will analyze the case of Ram Janbhumi, the case was filed on behalf of Ram Lala Virajman, who was himself seeking right of restoration of his original birthplace, as well as on behalf of devotees also. Both can file. Devotees can also file cases for restoration and the deity also can file. Now, why this, the first question which arises in my mind and when I discuss all these topics and the question which I get from everyone is, that why these cases are filed. So if you will see the cases for uh, which we are fighting, especially Mathura, especially Gyanavyapi, especially Kutum Minar, as was told, especially Lakshman Tila in, La in Lucknow, in Bhoshala, Dhar, there is a Saraswati temple. In all these cases, there is ample number of evidence and lot of documents historical, spiritual and legal research is there to show and to prove that a Hindu temple was existing prior in time. Now if 
if there is a historical research, if there is a uh, if there are a lot of evidences to show that yes, in this particular place we were prior in time, then the theme and concept of Hindu law, as I just enumerated, that once a property vests in the deity continues to remain deity's property, comes into picture, comes into play. Now the point is this: if I go a little bit uh, specific into some cases. For example, in Mathura Shri Krishna Janmuhumi case, there is the Farman of Aurangzeb, which is well recorded in history and it has been uh, referred by many historians. The original Farman is also there in uh, Asiatic uh, Museum of Calcutta, Asiatic Library of Calcutta, as well in many other places, where it has been categorically mentioned that Aurangzeb gave an order to demolish Shri Krishna Janmuhumi at Mathura. And it was reported to him that in 1670, it was demolished and after demolition also the temple was in ruins it is that temple which was in ruins which was tried to be renovated by madan mohan malviya ji which he couldn't do in his lifetime which is we and that is what we are trying to do we are trying to restore that place to its original glory that's our fight so if someone goes into history a uh, little bit more facts I'll give you so far as Mathura's case is concerned. In 1670, Aurangzeb demolished it. In 1705 or 7, Battle of Govardhan happened, in which Marathas won that entire area. For 100 years, the history remains silent. In 1803, the East India Company takes over the entire country. In 1815, the East India Company auctions the Sri Krishna Janbhumi property. 13.37 acres of land is involved, which was auctioned by the British government, the East India Company, and which was purchased by one Hindu Raja. His name is Raja Patnimal from Banaras. He purchased it, he purchased it in the auction. After that, uh, for uh, around in 1944, his property was sold by his uh, successors uh, to Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya Ji, and a trust was created, which is known as Shri Krishna Janbhumi Trust. And... Shri Krishna Janmumi Trust started getting uh, donations and uh, various kinds of contributions from various devotees and the idea was that they want to create a lofty temple there and at that point of time there was no question of any mosque there. It is so happened that on 12th of October 1968, a fake society was registered which has a very similar name to Shri Krishna Janmumi Trust and the name of the society was Shri Krishna Janmumi Seva Sang. And that society filed a case in the court and in the meantime the Muslims had encroached uh, around two acres of land of Sri Krishna Janbhumi and in that case a compromise happened which happened on 12th of October 1968 and it was finally decided that uh, we will maintain the status quo and as long as the encroachment part is concerned that will be not agitated by the Hindu parties. So after around uh, if you calculate, uh, I think, uh, 52 years, we challenged that compromise in the courts of law, saying that, first of all, this property belongs to Sri Krishna, Shri Krishna Janmumi Trust, which is still functional, and which kept mum, which kept negligent, and which did not speak for its rights. The original property vested in the deity through Sri Krishna Janmumi Trust. Therefore, a fake organization like Sri Krishna Janmumi Seva Sang has no role, has no business to enter into any compromise. That is point number one. Point number two, that uh, we also relied upon the settled principles of Hindu law as enumerated in Ram Mandir's case, that if a property has vested in the deity, a trust which is created is just a custodian of that property. It is not the owner, it is a custodian, it is having the rights of a shibayat. The property will vest in the deity through the trust. Just like Ram Mandir case, if you will see, a trust has been formed after the judgment of the Supreme Court. But the owner of the property will be Ramlala Virajman. The trust will just uh, be the custodian and the management rights will be with the trust. So if a trustee or a shibayat is negligent towards the rights of the deity, a devotee can always come into the courts of law and agitate for the rights of the Deity. That's the law which has been propounded by the Supreme Court in Ram Mandir's case. So on that basis, we filed the case in the courts of law in Mathura's district court. And ultimately, the court uh, initially rejected our plaint saying that uh, if this kind of cases are uh, entertained, lot of 
devotees will come in the court and which will create a law and order situation and social fabric of the country will be destroyed. But this finding was set aside by the district judge of Mathura uh, two months back and now the Muslims are in appeal in the high court. So the point is this, that whatever cases we are filing and I'll come to Gyan Vyapi also, we have very uh, micro level uh, documentation. We have very uh, detailed research into history. We have very detailed research into the spiritual aspect of those those places. And it is a question of restoration of the centers of our belief, faith and astha. Now, Sri Krishna Jan- Janusthan, where Lord Krishna took birth, where still the Karagar of Kans is there. That place finds a spiritual importance in Garg Sahita. That place finds a spiritual importance and it's a it's a place where people get uh, moksha or mukti after visiting the Janmasthan. So that kind of spiritual importance and that kind of uh, uh, adhyatmic importance that place is having. So it's our fundamental rights, it's, it's our duty to get those places restored through courts of law. And we have to prove and here in and I want to tell uh, inf- I want to emphasize on this point that so far as Sri Krishna Janmumi case is concerned on title on paper we still have the title of the property the sale deed by British government of Raja Patnimal of 13.37 acres of land is still in our possession is still with us so the property on paper is on us we are the owners but in actual if you will see someone has encroached around two acres of that land and we are only seeking removal of those two acres of encroachment so this is one example of Sri Krishna Janmumi case which we are fighting and and the point and purpose is that where we are existing prior in time and where there are temples which have been demolished we want to get those places restored we are not claiming any title or any kind of possession over any fresh mosque or any church. Where our temple and where our centers of faith, belief and worship, where our centers of civilization have been demolished, we are seeking restoration of those places. Now coming to Gyan Vyapi and Kashi case, see when we uh, were drafting and filing Gyan Vyapi case and Kashi's case, our legal team and research team did lot of research, a very detailed research uh, into the uh, adhyatmic uh, aspects, adhyatmic mahatva of Kashi. And uh, we also tried to research that whether any Shastras under the Hindu law have any importance of Kashi. Then lot of historical research was done over Kashi that uh, what is the historical importance, are there any proofs of demolition of a Hindu temple. And uh, let me tell you that when we did all this research, we found that in Kashi's case, the Skan Puran, the Shiv Mahapuran, all the Vedas and Shastras testify that the Kashi is the most important place for the Hindus. It's like the cradle of civilization for the Hindus. And if someone goes into the aspect as to how ancient the Kashi is, no one has been able to determine till date that how ancient the Kashi is. It's that prior in time. Before, like it is said in the Shastras and the Vedas that before the Shristi was, uh, before the universe was created, from that time Kashi is existing. From that time. So, I would like to quote here a beautiful proverb by James Princep because it's our irony that uh, about our history and about our uh, uh, Hindu dharma and shastric law, if some foreign writer says something, it is uh, it appeals to our uh, mind and body very much. So we we have done both kind of researches, one by the foreign writer and one what our own shastra say. So I will like to quote James Princep, who is a very well-known historian. So he says uh, something very interesting for Kashi. He says, the I am, and I am quoting, the Vedas and shastras all testify that Visheshwas, that Visheshwas is the first of the Devas, Kashi the first of the cities, Ganga the first of the rivers, and Charity the first of the virtues." Unquote. So this is the importance of Kashi and the Vedas and Puranas and Shastras, the sources of Hindu law, 
स्पेसिफिकली डिफाइन द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ फाइव कोर्स ऑफ आदि विशेश्वर लिंगम इन काशी विच इज कंसिडर्ड एज द फर्स्ट ऑफ द फाइव स्वयंभू ज्योतिर्लिंगम आउट ऑफ ट्वेल्व आउट ऑफ ट्वेल्व ज्योतिर्लिंग्स फाइव ज्योतिर्लिंग्स आर कंसिडर्ड टू बी स्वयंभू एंड आउट ऑफ फाइव ज्योतिर्लिंग विच आर स्वयंभू द वेरी फर्स्ट ज्योतिर्लिंग इज ऑफ काशी विच इज एट सिचुएटेड इन वाराणसी आदि विशेश्वर वी कॉल दम आदि विशेश्वर वी कॉल इट वेरी पॉपुलरली नो इफ आई विल लाइक टू कोट सर्टन वर्सेज फ्रॉम स्कन पुराण ऑल्सो स्कन पुराण चैप्टर नंबर सिक्स पेज नंबर फिफ्टी एट वर्स नंबर सेवेंटी वन इट सेज ऑल अदर फोर सेकेंड अविमुक्त प्लेसेज आर प्रोक्योर थ्रू काशी निर्वाणा to get nirvana i will like to say in bracket to get rid from the cycle of death and death and rebirth is achieved only after getting kashi the benefit of nirvana is not achieved by any other means even by residing in any other religious place now the next skand puran chapter number 7 page number 250 verse number 131 it says i am quoting uh, the avimukt area is in circle of five posts at this place there is visheshwar shivling which is jyotirling so there is direct very very direct uh, uh, shastrik uh, importance of kashi and it says that there is at this place there is visheshwar shivling which is jyotirling and the importance is given to that entire five course that entire five course is having lot of spiritual importance that entire five course is having uh, i can say adhyatmik energies and that entire five course is having lot of cosmic energies because of which we can have our adhyatmik and spiritual development so that's the importance of kashi and that five course and in the middle of that five course is standing the visheshwar shivling which is the jyotirling so if you have to calculate from where the five course starts it starts from visheshwar shivling which is uh, at which place at that place at at, at present there is the so called gyan vyapi mosque so after this spiritual research we did uh, there are other uh, um, extracts from shiv mahapuran and other uh, skand puranas but i would not like to go into that uh, because time is a little short here but i would like to tell you that all those researches were done and then we had uh, gone into the farman of aurangzeb where he had specifically ordered demolition of uh, uh, the kashi temple at uh, varanasi situated at varanasi and it was reported to him that yes the temple has been demolished and after demolition also i would like to bring here to everyone's knowledge that after demolition also the hindus never stopped their worship they kept worshiping at the plinth of the mosque as altrekar who is a very well known historian has written in his book that even after demolition in 1669 the hindus kept worship worshiping at the plinth of the mosque uh, believing that their deity is situated in, inside in fact in 1809 the district magistrate of varanasi had uh, written a letter to the then government saying that please return this uh, this auspicious place and this most important place for uh, the sanana sanatanis uh, back to their back to the hindus but uh, it couldn't so it couldn't so happen and i would uh, like to quote here uh, the farman of aurangzeb uh, and this is very important it has uh, the relevance of uh, it has relevance uh, so far as uh, the legal rights of hindus are concerned and it has relevance for those people who keep arguing that uh, there is no proof of demolition of a temple so this farman shows that there was a temple which was pre existing in time and this farman shows that that temple was demolished and the recent uh, commission and the reports which we have gathered show that still the temple and the so called gyanvyapi mosque is standing on the pillars of a hindu temple no new i want to tell here with lot of uh, uh, authority that and my this is my legal opinion that no new structure no new uh, structure was created to build a mosque the existing structure was converted into a mosque so the three mandaps which you see the three domes which you see of the mosque 
when we did the commission we saw beneath those three domes there are domes uh, there are shikhars of hindu temple we saw in the so called gyanvapi mosque lot of chins of swastik we uh, we saw in the so called gyanvapi mosque the western side is having all the ruins and all the signs of a hindu temple we saw the pillars which are uh, on which this so called gyanvapi mosque is standing it's uh, it's having all the pillars of a hindu temple then uh, we saw we found the shivling where the vazu was being done which has been stopped by the supreme court on 20th of may and kindly see this farman which i am just quoting now this farman of 18th april 1669 is in the book of is in the very well known book called history of india the author of this book is uh, historians h m elliot and john dawson and i am just quoting it uh, 18th april 1669 it reached the ear of his majesty the protector of the faith that in the province of tatha multan and banaras but especially in the latter foolish brahmins were in the habit of expounding frivolous books in their schools and that students and learners muslims as well as hindus went there even from long distances led by a desire to become acquainted with the wicked sciences they taught the director of the faith consequently issued orders to all the governors of the province to infidels and they were strictly enjoined to put an entire stop to the teaching and practicing of idolaters forms of worship on 15th rabiul akhir which is 2nd of september 1669 it was reported to his religious majesty leader of the unitarians that in obedience to the order the government officer has destroyed the temple of bishwanath at banaras now kindly see here there is a direct farman of demolition of the hindu temple now the question uh, which crops here uh, in a legal uh, uh, arena is that if there is a proof of demolition of a hindu temple then whether we don't have a right of restoration and especially kashi where there is i have as i just uh, told you that there is so much of uh, religious and spiritual and uh, shastric importance of this place and still the shivling is existing so in such a situation whether we uh, we should not fight for a cause and we should not unite together to seek restoration of this particular place of worship and whether when we are fighting for this case so i am as of now as a lawyer for hindu side i am as of now telling you the case the the foundational uh, structure of our case and on which and on what foundation our case is uh, built and on what foundation we have filed the case in the courts of law but at this point of time we must also ask and this question was asked uh, on the uh, on the uh, in at the bar that what is the case filed by the muslims what is their defense let me tell you that they have no defense apart from saying that we are worshiping in this property from 1669 we are offering a namaz in this property and this property they admit in their case in their suit in their reply that this property was demolished by aurangzeb so when there is a clear admission of a demolition of a hindu temple how can there be any muslim scholar in the country cannot say that after demolition of a hindu temple there can there a mosque can exist because it's a settled principle as per the waf law as per the islamic uh, as per the islamic law that a mosque can be built on a property which is self acquired which has been dedicated to allah which has been made as a waf by a musliman and after creation of that waf on a plain barren land a mosque can be built it is never it is not the islamic law it is not written in any of the verses of quran or any of the hadith that you can demolish a temple or a church and create a place of worship or mosque there rather the rather the rather it is reverse that if you do such thing if you offer namaz there it will not be accepted to allah so i am quoting here both the things i am not relying on islamic law so far as my case is concerned but i am saying that whatever has been done in the history is not permissible under islamic law also it is not permissible under hindu law also and therefore what i am trying to say here is this that there is a direct proof for demolition of a hindu temple after demolition of a hindu temple in 
we kept worshipping in the premises in question in deen muhammad's case which was filed by one of the muslims in varanasi 12 hindu witnesses have given evidence that we are worshipping in this property and how important this property and this uh, entire temple complex is for us i have also told you the letter written by um, district magistrate watson then uh, i want to hear just to uh, highlight this issue i want to hear just a quote from a very important book uh, which was written in 1822 by james princep and the name of this book is temple of visheshwar at banaras banaras illustrated and i would like to quote here what he says the hindus worship the plinth of the mosque as the plinth of the old kashi vishnat temple please see this just just please uh, if someone if you all are listening please just appreciate this thing the hindus worship the plinth of the mosque as the plinth of the old kashi vishnat temple m a sharing in 1868 wrote that extensive remains of temple destroyed by aurangzeb were still visible forming a large portion of western wall of the mosque he mentioned that the remnant structure also had jain and buddhist elements besides the hindu one so this is the this is the irony and after 1669 also we kept worshiping there was a case filed uh, in deen mohammed which is known as very famous case which is known as civil suit number 62 of 1936 which was filed by one of the muslim uh, uh, devotee in varanasi civil court and he said that this entire area should be declared as the waqf property and in that uh, case hindus were not made parties it was not a representative suit in that case uh, the british government had fought it on behalf of the uh, on behalf of the hindus without making hindus as party and in that cases 12 hindu witnesses had given evidence that we are worshiping in the so called mosque of visible and invisible deities but uh, in that case uh, it was also mentioned in that case that a hindu temple was demolished and the mosque was created and ultimately it was declared as a, a portion of that relief was uh, declared in favor of the muslims and some portion of that mosque was declared as waqf property against that uh, the muslims went in appeal first appeal before the allahabad high court this was rejected in 1942 so now the point is that we have taken an argument that din muhammad judgment is not uh, applicable to us because it was not a representative suit no hindus were parties in this case and rather the hindus made an application to become party to the case but it was uh, ultimately rejected so therefore uh, the judgment and decree which has been passed in din muhammad's case is not binding at all on us so this is uh, one aspect of it now if you will see one more uh, important aspect of kashi vishnan there is a special act passed by the up government in 1983 which is known as kashi vishnat uh, act of 1983 uttar pradesh kashi vishnat temple act 1983 in this uh, in this act the entire temple complex entire mosque complex has been declared as the property of adi visheshwar jyotirling so here in this case i would like to emphasize and enumerate and elaborate that in kashi vishnath case gyanvyapi case we do not have to prove or we do not have to labor or endeavor much on the fact that a temple was destroyed or this fa- or this property belongs to the hindus all these things are already proved and documented and by the legislature by the historians um by courts of law in earlier proceedings only thing we have to do is to remove this illegal encroachment by which this uh, our temple has been converted into a mosque and actually now coming to the other two topics also the places of worship act and uh, the waqf act how this places of worship act and waqf act does not apply in kashi case rather the places of worship act is in our favor when the question of kashi case is concerned see the point is this that uh, the suit which we have filed on behalf of all these five women devotees we have taken a categorical pleading that till november 1993 we were worshiping in the premises in question till november 1993 and it's a it's a admitted fact it's a historical fact 
that in November 1993, the Mulayam Singh government put barricading in the so-called uh, uh, Gyanvapi Mosque around the Gyanvapi Mosque. A barricading was put, and the Vyas Parivar, the Shibayas who were worshipping in the uh, basement in the cellar of the Gyanvapi Mosque, they were ousted from possession. The Hindus who were worshipping inside the Gyanvapi Mosque. They were ousted from possession. Their worship was stopped. Ma Shringar Gauri, which is on the western side of the Gyanvap, so-called Gyanvapi Mosque, they were stopped from worshiping Ma Shringar Gauri. And now, only on only once a year, on the fourth day of Chaitra Navratra, Ma Shringar Gauri is allowed to be worshipped on the western side of the mosque. Now, two questions uh, arise here. First is how can there be any Hindu deity on the western side of the mosque? If it's a mosque, very validly created, because when the uh, Muslims uh, do their, when the Muslims offer namaz, they always uh, head towards the west. So how can there be a Hindu deity towards the western side of the mosque? And the second point is that till November 1993, the Vyas Parivar was worshipping in the cellar in the Tehkana, and therefore the Places of Worship Act, which was enacted in 1991 operates in our favor because that character was changed that status quo was changed and we were ousted from the property in question completely so this this is like uh, uh, the long and short of the gyanvapi case and how the places of worship act comes into picture now the uh, muslim uh, parties the masjid committee also had taken uh, certain objections in our case of uh, the uh, waf act and their argument uh, was before the court that this suit cannot be adjudicated by the civil court and it has to go to the waf tribunal as per section 83 and 85 of the waf act 1995 now when we did uh, research into this part and for proving their point and to buttress their argument they had placed a document which uh, uh, in which they said that it is registered as a waf, WAF property and the document said it's a alamgir mosque now when we did research there are so many mosques in one varanasi which is known as which are which is known as alamgir mosque because alamgir is a uh, also one of the names of aurangzeb and the history says that when he came to varanasi he had demolished many temples priti vasheshwar bindu madhav as well as gyanvapi and other temples were also demolished in varanasi and in front of that document which was placed by the muslim parties the masjid committee to say that it's a it's a work property when we analyze that document only in front of it only in that uh, work registration number it was written as work number 100 in front of work number 100 it was written as alamgir uh, mosque and the revenue number the khasra number was left blank the khasra number and the revenue number of this property is khasra number 9130 which is all i don't know what it's called in kerala and at your place but in uh, in up the revenue entries are known as khasra numbers or survey numbers you can understand it by way of survey numbers so this property is having a survey number of 9130 it is registered as survey number 9130 now when the wf has done the registration that registration our argument is does not pertain to gyanvapi mosque because no survey number has been mentioned and lastly we had uh, uh, placed the judgment of the supreme court of 1979 as well as 2010 where the supreme court has said uh, it's one judgment is delivered by honorable mr justice kadju he has said that if uh, one person is a muslim and one party is a hindu in that situation the waf act will not apply so if any entry is made in the register of waf you can make any entry in your own register you can declare my property as waf property but those entries will not be binding upon me and if any dispute arises so far as that particular portion is concerned we can always go to the civil court for such adjudication so on 12th of september 2022 the honorable uh, district judge after uh, hearing both the parties after hearing the muslim side after hearing us he passed the order saying that first of all in this case 
the wa fact is not applicable our arguments were uh, recorded and uh, it was held in our favor that the wa fact is not applicable it was also held that the places of worship act is not applicable because till november 1993 we were worshiping in the property in question that's the plain environment so now evidence will be led and the third point was the kashi vishnath act is a uh, uh, operating in our favor so the argument of raised by the muslim side of kashi vishnath act is also not applicable in the present scenario now after uh, the judgment of uh, 12th of september now the next step uh, which we are heading towards is to prove our case by way of an evidence by way of evidence and to buttress our submission and to show that the shivlingam which was found on 16th of uh, may is a shivlingam because the muslims have filed an affidavit in the court saying that this uh, this object which has been found in the advocate commission's report on 16th of may is not a shivlingam it's a it's a fountain they have filed an affidavit so now one part and it, and they have also filed an affidavit saying that it has to be adjudicated now we went to the courts of law saying that uh, if one party is saying that it's a shivlingam and the other party is saying that it's a uh fountain then what's the what's the mode of adjudication so therefore we had requested for scientific investigation by the asi of the wazu area which has been sealed by the supreme court we had asked for scientific investigation so that it can be ascertained that the through ground penetrating radar and through various other uh, scientific methods which are there available with the asi by which it can be uh, ascertained that how old the shivlingam is and if this is proved that this shivlingam is uh, uh, having a particular uh, period of time then definitely it will help our case because uh, the entire theory of mosque being constructed and uh, no hindu temple being destroyed all those uh, arguments which are raised by the muslim side without any evidence and against the historical facts will also be will also be demolished as well as the asi's uh, uh, proof and report will have a very conclusive expert opinion as per section 45 of the indian evidence act as well as uh, as per section uh, as per order 26 rule 10 uh, a of the cpc where the court has power to direct scientific investigation and the court has power to issue scientific commission to investigate any particular point of time so our point is this that if one party is saying it's a shivlingam and other party is saying it's a fountain by no other means it can be ascertained that what is the character of that uh, property or what is the that character of that object because it cannot be decided by plebiscite it cannot be decided by uh, asking the election commission to take votes from the masses it can only be decided by way of an expert evidence so we had uh, we had filed that application and that application has been rejected by the district judge now we are uh, challenging that order in the higher courts but the point is this that uh, i believe that at some point of time the uh, courts of law will uh, definitely take expert opinion in the matter and let me also tell you that on 8th of april 2021 one of the civil judge uh, senior division of varanasi had ordered for asi survey of the entire temple complex so it's not that uh, our demand is very new and it is not well founded in ram mandir's case also the asi uh, uh, opinion as well the report of the asi became a very crucial part became a very very important part for adjudication of the dispute because uh, these are the cases where we are uh, trying to uh, figure out and ascertain that what happened 500 years back 600 years back and therefore without the help of an archaeological survey these kind of facts uh, cannot be ascertained because in these aspects uh, the asi is an expert as a lawyer as a person who is uh, uh, doing litigation we can bring out a historical research which is having evidentiary value as per section 57 of the indian evidence act we can bring out various uh, travel logs we can bring out various uh, evidences of the locals who are saying that yes we were worshiping in the premises in question from past uh, 30 40 years but so far as uh, other questions are involved in the case without an archaeological survey i think it will it, it cannot be decided and therefore i believe that there is already an order of 8th of april of the civil judge senior division directing asi 
of the entire property and the Muslims, uh, the Masjid Committee has challenged that order in the High Court. The High Court has stated. So someday I think it will be adjudicated. But the point is this, that to prove our case, uh, as I just uh, briefly pointed out here uh, to all of you, that what are, what is our research and what is the foundation of our uh, case. If you will analyze the arguments raised by the Masjid Committee, apart from saying that we were offering namaz in this area, there is no other proof. Apart from saying that we are offering namaz, and we are offering namaz from uh, last uh, 400 years, 300 years, 200 years, there is no other proof which they are having to show that they have cre uh, they have built this mosque on a barren land. In fact, uh, I would like to uh, point out very interesting thing. In Deen Muhammad's case, it was categorically mentioned that uh, Aurangzeb has demolished this property and therefore it cannot be ever created as a waf. And therefore the argument of waf by user was uh, uh, elaborated by them. This argument was taken. The argument of verb by user comes at that point of time when you don't know that who created the verb. That through customary law, through your usage, you are using this property as a mosque. So therefore, this uh, uh, argument of verb by user was raised by them. And therefore, a very small portion of this property was declared as a verb property that to verb by user. Because Aurangzeb could never create a verb, which uh, because the law of verb is that you have to have your self-acquired property as a waf property and that property only can be dedicated to Allah and on that property only a valid mosque can be built. So when all these uh, proofs were not there, so argument of waf by user was taken by the Muslim side. So this is uh, this is the long and short of Gyan Vyapi and I would also like to elaborate here that uh, the constitutional validity of places of worship act is challenged by us before the Honorable Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has issued notice in the matter. Uh, the Supreme Court has given last date of uh, filing counter affidavit to the uh, central government by 31st of October. And the constitutional validity of uh, the uh, Places of Worship Act will be ascertained and determined by the Supreme Court. And there are certain questions which, uh, which fall for consideration when we see the Places of Worship Act. First of all, this question uh, that is there any use and relevance of places of worship act also arises what is the I, I i want to ask a question to myself if places of worship act was not enacted what would have been the legal situation and what would have been the practical situation the legal and the practical situation would have been that for restoration of any place of worship a person who has proofs and who has documents and who has research, he would have filed his cases in the courts of law. Now section 4.2 of the Places of Worship Act bars such judicial review. Section 4.2 of the Places of Worship Act says that if any suit is filed in the courts of law for converting a place of worship, that suit will be uh, that suit will abate and if any revision or appeal is pending, that will also abate. So we have actually challenged the constitutional validity of section 4.2 of the Places of Worship Act on the footing and on the premise that the uh, basic structure of the constitution is judicial review. The right to approach courts of law, the right to, dis right to solve any dispute in a democratic society by peaceful manner by courts of law is a fundamental right, it's a basic structure of the constitution and therefore section 4.2 of the Places of Worship Act violates that provision. Second part is this, that Places of Worship Act is silent on the point that if there is any temple or any mosque or any church which has been demolished by any section of the society and if there is a proof of demolishing that temple or mosque or church, whether courts, whether suits can be filed for restoration of such places or not. Because actually to be very uh, candid with the, all of you, Places of Worship Act is not dealing with the aspects of Hindu law. Places of Worship Act, while enacting uh, Places of Worship Act, the concepts and themes of Hindu deities, the rights of fundamental rights of Hindu deities, 
which flow from article 363 as well as from the hindu shastric law that has not been considered as well as the islamic law as well as the christian law and other religious texts have not been considered while enacting places of worship act and a very illegal and unconstitutional cut off date of 15th august 1947 has been enacted uh, in places of worship act and the question is and the point is that why 15th august 1947 will be the cut off date if there has to be a cut off date it has to be 1192 if someone uh, has so much of feelings and uh, um, historical historic belief that jain temples and buddhist temple have also been destroyed so cut off date has to be prior to that but the point is this my point is this that on 15th august 1947 we had just got independence it is after independence that we had to uh, do uh, we have to correct the historical wrongs and uh, in ram mandir's case also my senior mr parasaran said that uh, historical wrongs have to be rectified our constitution is a transformative constitution article 13 gives a right uh, gives a power that if there is any order which has been passed which violates any of the provisions of part 3 of the fundamental rights that order will be null and void so the question is if uh, aurangzeb has passed the farman of demolition of a hindu temple my point is this and i ask a question to myself whether that farman is in violation of article 25 or not and if that farman is in violation of article 25 what is the necessary corollary what is the impact of declaring that farman is unconstitutional the impact will be to restore the temple which was existing at that point of time so therefore therefore on these footings the places of worship act has been challenged and if someone and and i want to tell here that we have not challenged section 3 of the places of worship act we have not challenged we have only challenged the constitutional validity of section 4 which takes away the power of judicial review if one will analyze section 3 of the places of worship act with the facts of gyan vyapi with the facts of mathura and any and so many temples who have been which have been demolished in kashmir it will you will find that there is a punishment for converting a place of worship of a religious denomination under section 6 of the act so we are saying that we do not want to convert any other uh, place of worship of uh, any other uh, belief into our faith into our place of worship rather they, rather that uh, that provision is constitutional but where you are restricting my right under section 4 for restoration i want to like uh, clarify here that section 3 is prospective in nature while section 4 is retrospective in nature <coughs> so where our right is taken away for restoration we are fighting for that uh, that portion only and i would like to tell here that if you will see as i as i told you the facts of gyanvapi case that till november 1993 we were doing uh, worship and puja in the premises in question the vyas ji of uh, kashi the vyas parivar was uh, having possession of the tahkana the cellar which is beneath the gyanvapi so called gyanvapi mosque so in violation of section 3 of the places of worship act he was ousted from possession because section 3 said that the status quo will remain and if you violate that status quo it will have a punishment under section 6 no person will change the religious character of a religious denomination into other so the character which existed on 15th august 1947 has to be ascertained and determined and our submission is and our case is that the character which was existing on 15th august 1947 of kashi of mathura and many more temples is of a hindu temple <coughs> just by entering into a premise of a hindu temple and if you offer namaz there it will never have a characteristic of a mosque or a church and therefore section 3 has been violated so far as kashi vishnath act is concerned and i would also like to throw light on uh, other aspect which uh, which we which we are talking today is the constitutional validity of waf act i would like to tell here that we have challenged the constitutional validity of waf act 1995 before ilahabad high court the notice has been issued uh, by the honorable high court by the honorable chief justice as well as on mr justice j j munir who is part of the bench to the uh, central government to the attorney general to the advocate general and 
certain provisions of work act are very draconian like section 4 5 and 6 uh, which gives power to declare some properties as work property and the survey the survey has been conducted survey is conducted for determining the work properties under section 8 of the work act 1995 the cost of the survey is borne by the state government now which is in clear violation of article 27 because no such provision is there for uh, the hindu for the hindu or for christian or for jain or for buddh or for parsi that their property will be ascertained by the state government as to how much their property is and the survey will be conducted for other sections of the society and for that survey the cost will be borne by the state government there is no such provision like that but for uh, muslims to appease uh, muslims and to have uh, 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 as per the appeasement policy, the Congress government in nineteen ninety five enacted this Wolf Act, and uh, by virtue of section four, five, and six of the Wolf Act, survey is conducted, and under section eight, the uh, cost of the survey is borne by the state government. I would also like to mention here that under section six of the Wolf Act, initially the word was person aggrieved. I'm sorry. Initially the word was person interested. So till 2013, when it was not amended, Section Six uh, One was not amended. The word was "person interested," meaning thereby, if uh, a survey is conducted, and suppose my property comes in that survey as a work property, so the law was that till 2013 that I need not, uh, like I am not legally bound to challenge that order in uh, the work tribunal. I can, uh, I am not in fact bound at all by that order because. Uh, because i am not a person interested in 2013 the congress government changed that definition from person interested to person aggrieved and now the law is that if a survey is conducted and my property falls within the purview of work property i am bound to challenge it in the work tribunal and it has been affirmed by the supreme court by a, by a judgment of honorable justice uh, ashok bhushan uh, in 2019 so uh, therefore we have challenged the constitutional validity of section 6 4 and 5 and 8 that these provisions are unconstitutional the wolf act should not apply to uh, non muslims as well as we have also i would like to bring to your knowledge that section 40 sub clause 3 of the wolf act is very draconian it says that a uh, wolf board can declare any property as wolf property even if it is belonging to a math mandir trust temple church anything it can declare it as a work property and the person whose property has been declared as a work property will also not be informed that his property has been declared as a work property they will inform to the organization to the registrar of the society or the registrar of the trust where that property is registered and you have to challenge that order within one year that's the legal uh, obligation so the point is this that under section 40 sub clause 3 of the work act 1995 if you are declaring my property as the work property such kind of uh, arrogance is there that you will not even communicate to us that our property has been declared as work property and against that order you want me to file an appeal you want me to challenge it in the work tribunal and we will not be communicated also it will be communicated to the registrar of the societies or the trust who, who we all know that what happens in the registrar of the societies and the trust where uh, uh, no communication is made to the aggrieved person and the third point is that how can you give such a power to a particular community to declare any property as a work property whether such power is there with the members of the hindu community whether such power is there with the members of christian sikh jain buddhist or parsi community to declare any property as work property taj mahal has been declared as work property by the work board in 2005 the asi is in appeal in the supreme court i would also like to mention the recent example of tamil nadu where temple has been declared as the work property and there are so many examples in north india uh, especially i would like to mention here one example of chandrashekhar shahid chandrashekhar who who we all know was a freedom fighter and who gave his shahadat in uh, prayagraj ilahabad that park there was a park which was dedicated for him it was known as uh, initially it was known as company bag then it was known as alfred park now it has been renamed as chandrashekhar azad park that park uh, uh, was captured uh, by members and sections of muslim society and that park was uh, some portion of that park was de declared as work property 
the buff number is buff number 294 of 91 so that this power of declaring any property as buff property does not belong to any other member or any other section of the society and therefore this entire section 40 sub clause 3 is unconstitutional it is in violation of article 300 and a 300 a so we have challenged that provision as well as section 53 and 54 of the uh, WAF Act which gives them power to uh, 50 uh, yes 53 and 54 of the WAF Act which gives them power to remove encroachments and direct the state administration to remove encroachments is also illegal and unconstitutional because you see the discrimination that if uh, as a Hindu my property is being encroached or if a temple land is being encroached for us the normal law is that you have to go and approach the civil court and you have to file a civil suit and you have to fight a long legal battle to get those remove that to get those encroachments removed but so far as members of muslim community as co are concerned if any property has been encroached which is a work property they can direct the dm and ssp to get those encroachment removed uh, by to get those encroachments uh, removed by virtue of section 53 and 54 and the and the state government state administration has to comply with their order so it's like they become super bosses in our own country and then the draconian provision of section 89 if you have to file a case against the verb board you have to give them notice two months prior notice just it's parallel peri material section to section 80 of the cpc which says that if you have to file a case against government you have to give them two months prior notice so they have been given a status of a parallel government under section 89 and if you want to file a case against a, a temple property or a deity's property you don't give, you don't have to give us a prior notice there is no such provision for the members of hindu christian jain buddha or sikhs but this special provision is made under section 89 for the members of the muslim community and the most uh, i think hilarious part of waf act is section 101 of the WAF Act, section 101, 101 of the WAF Act, where the members or mutwallis and the members of the WAF board have been made as public servants. I want to ask a question here that no temple, priest, pujari, mahant, purohit, shankarachar has been ever given a status of a public servant in this country. If any, any, any listener or any legal luminary of the country can show me a single provision where a Shankarachar, Mahant, Pujari, Purohit, Mahant, Priest or in fact a, a member of a church or of a Sikh community or of Jain community or Buddhist community has been declared as a public servant then I would also enhance my knowledge but uh, as far as I know that no such legal provision is there for any other section of the society but for section 101 these people the verb board the members of verb board the mutwallis they all have been given the status of public servant for them the limitation does not run under section 107 they want if they rise after 200 years 300 years and they believe that this property is a verb property they can declare it for us there is a particular period of limitation we have to file cases as per limitation act 1963 within a particular period of time so all those provisions have been challenged before the uh, constitutional validity of all these provisions have been challenged before the Allahabad high court and uh, notices have been issued it's fixed for hearing on 15th of december and uh, let's see how it uh, proceeds but uh, uh, the point here is that wurf act 1995 section 4 of the places of worship act 1991 as well as the Gyanivapi case and the Mathura case and all these cases where there are proofs of dis demolition of a Hindu temple all these cases can my legal interpretation is that all these cases can be filed and the courts of this country are uh, powerful enough to grant relief of restoration if uh, Ram Mandir can be restored then other 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 centers of our belief faith and worship and Astha can also be restored through a democratic uh, way by courts of law and therefore uh, in light of all these in, in in this background we have filed these cases and i would like to now give the mic uh, to the organizers to proceed further thank you thank you vishnu ji that was very enlightening and at the, at the same time i can know many aspects of the law that uh, we didn't know came to light today uh Sharad, actually, we can we can turn on the hand raising those who would like to ask a question please come up do remember uh, when you ask the question once it's been heard and you got the answer back 
you will be sent back to the audience that we usually follow it will be followed today also uh, our youtube channel this is screen recorded it will be uploaded to your youtube channel it is pinned on top now uh, please do subscribe and uh, share with your family and members and uh, follow the moderators also we will be conducting more uh, sessions in similar manner and those who are asking the question kindly ask in a very concise manner take 30 seconds or a minute uh, to complete the question uh, it doesn't require too much of a introduction uh, to ask the questions please do remember that and also you have to understand we can ask the question Vishnuji will give his opinion please do not argue uh, to have uh, the answer that you have in mind also and uh, I think actually we can go back to uh, the questioners Andolan please yeah. go ahead uh, Namaskar Vishnuji Sabse pehle to sat sat naman jis prakar ki aap sevaay de rahe hai hindu samaj ke liye mere khyal se mere parivar mere aur mere parivar ki taraf se aapko sat sat naman hai मेरा एक छोटा सा प्रश्न था विष्णु जी जब हम लोग प्लेसेस ऑफ वर्शिप एक्ट एंथ्रोलॉजी जस्ट अ सेकंड इफ यू कैन आस्क इन इन इंग्लिश इट विल बी बेटर फॉर योर ऑडियंस शो शो सो विष्णु सर यू नो माय क्वेश्चन वाज यू नो व्हेन व्हेन वी रेफर टू प्लेसेस ऑफ वर्शिप एक्ट इट सेस टॉक्स अबाउट द स्टेटस ऑफ द रिलीजियस साइट एज ऑफ 15th ऑफ अगस्त 1947 सो वुड दैट टिपिकली मीन that exactly on that day 15th of august 1947 or would it mean before 15th of august 1947 you know the reason i'm asking this question let's say in the case of uh, let's take any example uh, for uh, that matter even uh, kashi uh, temple which we are fighting the case on uh, in case uh, on that particular date 15th of august 1947 in the gyanwapi campus namaz was not held and it can be established and whereas uh, you know the prayers were held uh, on that particular day which is 15th of august 1947 and that can be established uh, you know uh, uh, you know in the courts would that mean that the nature of the place as on 15th of august was that of a hindu temple and not anything else yeah very good afternoon uh, i understood uh, what you are trying to say <clears throat> see if you will analyze section 4 1 and 4 2 of the places of worship act the word which are used is religious character as existing on 15th august 1947 so religious character is a very vast uh, uh, very uh, it's a word which is subject to various interpretations and our interpretation and submission is that once a property has vested in the deity and that uh, proof of vesting is there then it will always remain deity's property so the religious character of a place of worship once it has vested in the deity it can never change for example if as of now if there is a temple and you come and offer namaz in a temple whether the religious character of that temple will change or vice versa if i go and put a murti or an idol in a mosque whether the religious character of a mosque will change or if i put a if i idol if i put a idol in a church whether the religious character of the church will change the only answer can be it can never change because whoever is prior in time the religious character of that property will remain the same and therefore the places of worship act uses the word religious character the legislature never intended to enact such a law which will validate such kind of demolitions in the past actually the problem is that whenever we talk about places of worship act we always uh, flow by the narrative which is uh, floated in the society that places of worship act uh, is very draconian and it bars uh, such kind of suits that's what i tried to enumerate in our chat also that's i have only challenged section 4 sub clause 2 of the places of worship act which takes away the judicial review principle so far as uh, <clears throat> so far as a conversion which has taken place has is 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 required but uh, we have come we have succeeded uh, uh, in the courts of law with our interpretation that the religious character 
uh, has to be determined by way of an evidence in the suit and it's not just that it's it is my opinion when the matter had traveled to the supreme court the gyanvapi case the the bench also through legal discussion observed and gave example of agyari and cross and said that if uh, if in a in a gyari a cross has been put uh, the religious character has to be determined by way of an evidence so my point is this an answer to your question is this the religious character word has to be interpreted and our interpretation is <clears throat> and it will be interpretation by all the uh, sections of the society as well as muslims also they will also say that that in a mosque if an idol has been installed it can never have uh, it can never lose its religious character therefore the point is that if therefore what is the way to determine this the way is to prove who is prior in time and exactly that's why i tro- told you the spiritual and shastric mahatva the proof of demolition and to show that we were prior in time because if one goes and establishes that we are prior in time or if a particular section of the society is prior in time then the religious character of that property will always have the character of a temple or a mosque who was prior in time and who had initially done the installation and in whom initially the property had vested therefore section 4 as you rightly told uh, 15th august 1947 religious character has to be determined and that will be done only by way of an evidence in the courts of law yes thank you sir thank you thank you antolan ji uh, the next question is santosh please go ahead santosh santosh i hope you can hear me yes go ahead yeah yeah uh, thank you ravi and thank you vishnu ji uh, i have one question uh, i would like to know your honest opinion about our cons- constitution see uh, is our constitution is biased towards uh, hindus as being majority or uh, if the answer is yes uh, what is the uh, remedy or solution which you think uh, which will be practical thank you and in understand what your voice is not clear sir can you please again repeat yeah my question is is our constitution biased i mean uh, negatively biased towards hindus being uh, the uh, majority in our country like uh, constitution is biased uh, towards the minority and if the answer is yes what is the remedy to be uh, for it has to be neutral i don't think that the constitution is biased towards hindus or it's biased towards the muslims the people who are interpreting the constitution and inter- implementing the constitution they may be biased but the constitution as such is uh, not biased and can never be biased it's a document uh, which has uh, passed the test of time and uh, there have been amendments and in future there will be amendments but our constitution is a transformative constitution as i told you but i believe and i feel that the people who are interpreting the constitution who are implementing the constitution because of their biasness and because of the minority appeasement politics uh, this kind of situation is arisen in the country thank you santosh uh, rk go ahead yeah namaste vishnu ji uh, thank you uh, first of all i thank you for your services for the hindu community uh, and i thank uh, the moderators for bringing you in today and my question is like uh, the the, uh, the answer you gave to the previous uh, person uh, i just want to uh, ask on it on again like you know he asked about the bias yeah you said the constitution is not biased but the people who uh, you know uh, interpret it is so i am worried uh, to be very honest i just want to ask you one question like what are our chances on the hindu side what are our chances uh, because uh, we have been in possession you know hindus have been in possession of the temple so definitely i think i feel positive there but again another my second question is uh, the you know the kind of interpretation is going on now like uh, wokeism and judicial activism is more uh, there in the judiciary now uh, as the leftist liberal approaches uh, you know uh, uh making you know influence on the judges and judgments uh, especially uh, we have seen in the shabri mala case also so i just want you to uh, just uh, say your view on that also uh, my first question is like you know uh, what is our chances on the ganbabi mosque and kashi vishnath temple case see i am asking another question 
सपोज टेक अ वर्स के सिनेरियो वर्स के सिनेरियो लेट्स फर्स्ट टॉक अबाउट द नेगेटिव्स इवन इफ वी लूज द केस एट लीस्ट वी फॉट एट लीस्ट इट वाज बेटर देन कीपिंग मम द एंटायर सिविलाइजेशन एंड द कम्युनिटी इज कीपिंग मम फ्रॉम पास सो मेनी इयर्स लेट मी टेल यू द फर्स्ट केस इन ज्ञान व्यापी आफ्टर 1669 डिमोलिशन वाज फाइल्ड इन 1991 so i am saying that they don't have any hopes don't have any hopes that i will win the case for you or whatever at least be happy that we have raised our voice that itself is sufficient because from 1669 till 1991 there was not even a single voice which was raised to get back our place of worship at least we are fighting at least we are trying to lay the foundation if this thought was there in the uh, minds of people who had fought for ram janmabhoomi let me tell you when gopal singh visharat filed the case in 1950 he ne- he he never saw the light of the day the judgment was delivered in 2019 he he never knew that whether he will see such a day mr uh, agarwal who had drafted uh, the suit for ramlala virajman he never saw the beautiful moment which we are going to see in 2024 that whether they'll be victory or they'll be loss but at least they fought in their time so i am very happy i'm not here to give you any assurances that yes sir our case is very strong we will definitely win i am having lot of satisfaction sir today that at least i'm fighting i am not sitting as a silent spectator if there any injustice if there is any injustice which has been done in the past at least this civilization this community is rising and we are at least fighting i don't mind that whether in this clubhouse there are 20 people 30 people 5 people who are listening to us but i'm at least happy that we all are uniting here to at least talk about this topic otherwise uh, 10 years back this topic was uh, a very very communal topic you can't even talk about the injustice which has been meted out to us so i am to just telling you rk sir that i'm very happy that i'm fighting and if uh, and the chances i i am not here to predict any chances or give any assurances but uh, we have a very strong legal foundation on which basis this case has been filed and let us see what happens in the courts of law at least uh, this civilization has uh, uh, raised its voice against the injustice which has been done in the past thank you vishnu ji thank you rk all right uh, i appreciate that and uh, i understand and appreciate that thank you for the service and i really want to appreciate you what you are doing for what you are doing and i just was uh, i was just uh, you know worried about the thing that's why i questioned it i like uh, it was just a question of uh, you know what doubt i have i was having i just asked it uh, no, I anyway uh, I, I, i wish you all the very best and uh, we hope uh, you to get to win the case uh, and uh, definitely i will pray for it thank you Okay, we will go to the next questioner, uh, Ajay. Thank you. Namaskar, Vishnu Ji. I will speak a little bit about Hindi, because I am from Varanasi, I am from Vishnu Ji. I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so I am from Varanasi. So, I am from Varanasi, so उसके नीचे के खुदाई के लिए क्या आप लोग क्या कर रहे हैं यदि उसके नीचे यदि खोदा जाए बाबा के नीचे जो उसके नीचे निश्चित रूप से हम काशी वासियों की जो सोच है उसके नीचे बाबा का आर्यता निश्चित नहीं मिलेगा जिससे सिद्ध हो जाएगा तो कोई गड़बड़ रेटिंग कुछ की आवश्यकता नहीं है नीचे अजय जी आपका 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 नेटवर्क थोड़ा सा थोड़ा सा खराब है आपको थोड़ा सा नेटवर्क वाला एक्चुअली जगह पे जा सकता है साउंड थोड़ा सा क्रैक करके आ रहा है विष्णु जी आ रही ओके हेलो कैन यू कैन यू लिसन हेलो यस यस हेलो श्योर श्योर गो है वही मैं कह रहा था विष्णु जी की जो बाबा का जो शिवलिंग मिला है वहाँ पे यदि उसके नीचे की खुदाई की जाए तो बाबा का अर्घा भी मिल जाएगा इससे साक्षात प्रूफ हो जाएगा कि बाबा वहीं पे थे तो क्या इसके लिए क्या आप लोग कुछ कर रहे हैं कैसे क्या
कृष्ण जी यूर ऑन म्यूट यस मैंने आपको जैसे बताया अजय जी कि हमने अर्घा के लिए ऑलरेडी एप्लीकेशन दायर की थी जिसको डिस्ट्रिक्ट जज साहब ने रिजेक्ट कर दिया अब उसके अगेंस्ट हम हायर कोर्ट में जा रहे हैं किसी ने वहाँ पे कार्बन डेटिंग की मांग नहीं की थी वो भ्रम फैलाया गया था हमने साइंटिफिक इन्वेस्टिगेशन और खुदाई की मांग की थी जीपीआर सर्वे की मांग की थी और बिल्कुल आपकी बात सही है कि अगर अर्घा मिलेगा तो उससे काफ़ी चीज़ें प्रूव हो जाएंगी और उसी के लिए हम लोग प्रयासरत हैं उसमें हायर कोर्ट्स में हम जा रहे हैं Thank you, Ajay. The next question is also in Ajay. Ajay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, moderators, uh, and Namaste, Vishnu ji. Uh, thank you for uh, taking up this course and uh, getting a positive results in the beginning of this uh, litigation. So, congratulations to you. Congratulations to all of us. So, I had two questions basically. Number one is uh, like you are mentioning about the Limitation Act, right? So, I was just wondering, like. Uh, uh for uh, filing a judicial review right these a uh, couple of acts we mentioned right we mentioned the uh you know the draconian aspects of uh, these acts right so now to go for a judicial review is there any any limitation uh, you know posed by this limitation act or can we still go ahead and file that is more from a constitution from a legal uh, you know angle and uh, second one was like there was a subsequent plea that was for a dating of uh, you know uh the uh, shivling right and, and now uh, that was uh, that plea was rejected uh, showing that uh, supreme the ratio i think was like uh, supreme court has already ordered to protect it and uh, now okay we, we everybody knows it the ratio behind it right so i mean is it fine does it uh, anyway impact uh, the the ongoing uh, the, the first plea uh, i mean the rejection of uh, the carbon dating right uh, will it in any any ways uh, Impact the first. I have understood uh, your question. I will reply. See, you. first of all, uh, the limitation act you have asked for. See if there is a temple which was existing, and if that has been demolished, then uh, some people are offering namaz there or offering prayers there. It's a continuing continuing wrong. So the limitation act is not attracted. That is point number one. Point number two, if you will read the Ram Mandir judgment also, in fifteen hundred and thirty, the temple was demolished and the case was filed in nineteen fifty. because uh, that's the best time when we can file the case so in uh, kashi vishnath case also when the date is existing there and you are worshiping and offering namaz it's a principle of continuing wrong that is point number 1 so when there is continuing wrong the limitation act does not apply second is that hindu deity is a perpetual minor and against the minor the limitation act also does not run so on these two principles we are like out of the purview of the limitation act now your last question of carbon dating let me tell you that we had not filed an application for carbon dating it was a misnomer we had filed an application for scientific investigation and this is what i answered in hindi to the other uh, person also that we had filed an application for scientific investigation and we had asked for excavation we had asked for uh, ascertaining the age and the length of the shivlingam which was discovered on 16th of may and that application was wrongly rejected by the district judge holding that the supreme court has sealed the area without noticing the fact that on 20th of may the supreme court has directed the honorable district judge to decide the entire trial and the suit and all the applications without uh, and ignoring the fact that for this demand we had went to the supreme court the supreme court directed us to file this uh, application before the district judge so on a preliminary question this application has been rejected that uh, you have to that i don't have the power to decide this application while the fact of the matter is that supreme court empowered the district judge to decide this application so we will challenge it definitely in the higher courts and it will not have any bearing on the case because uh, this is additional evidence which we are trying to lead by way of an archaeological survey and do the excavation of the premises in question and to ascertain the shivlingam but at no point of time there was any demand for carbon dating of the shivlingam there was demand of excavation and scientific investigation of the vazu area of the shivlingam which has been found on 16th of may and uh, the yes you are right it has been rejected but that rejection and the and the finding and the grounds of those rejections are not well founded and therefore definitely we will approach the higher courts and challenge it 
thank you Vishnu ji. But uh, okay, I got your point actually. The data is a perpetual manner and therefore the limitation act won't apply uh, in the case of uh, deity and the guardian. That is the, the trust. But uh, my uh, doubt was basically from a constitutional angle. So l let's say let any act that is passed in 90, let's say 90s, right? So can we at this stage, this is more from an academic, uh, uh, you know, uh, like just to understand the constitutional aspect of that part, right? Uh, now, uh, like, can we go, like, is there any limitation for challenging the constitutionality of the act, right? For example, the court has to consider this there severability. Is no limitation, there is no oh. limitation for challenging the constitutionality of an act. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, anu, you can ask your question. Um, Namaste. Actually, my question was uh, somewhat similar to the previous one. So I think uh, I've clarified my doubt there. Thank you, Anuji. Uh, yeah. Disha. Uh, namaste, moderators. Uh, namaste, Vishnuji. Uh, thank you uh, for yours and your father's service to the Sanathan. Uh, my question is quite similar to what uh, Ajay ji asked. So there are a lot of uh, acts which was being, uh, you know, um, implemented during the UPA, which was completely against, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hindus. Uh, I'll, tell you, uh, I'll uh, say it loud and clear. So uh, I think it would be easier for us to first deal with these acts, uh, challenge these acts in the courts, and then go ahead with, uh, you know, um, restoring our uh, temples. I think that way it would be much easier because um, like, for example, uh, Endowment Act, we need to challenge that act um, where uh, government is still in procession of uh, uh, the temples, Hindu temples especially. And um, acts like uh, the Vakt Board, which is there. Uh, it, because these are hurdles that we will have to always, um, you know, uh, answer before uh, we get into a certain point where the case gets easier for us. You think it will be easier if we deal with the uh, illegal unconstitutional acts which was being brought in and then uh, start looking at uh, uh, taking over our temples? Do you think uh, this could be easier? Thank I you. I think both the things can go simultaneously. At some point of time, uh the controversy of war fact has to be given a quietus by the supreme court at some point of time the controversy of places of worship act has to be given a quietus by the supreme court but till that time uh, suppose it happens after 10 years 15 years till that time we can't uh, just keep mum and we can't just keep waiting for these issues to be decided because if we analyze the facts of a particular case it is very evident that uh, no there is no bar for us to file a suit there is no bar under the places of worship act or for the work act for restoration of these places so the 12th of september judgment by the varanasi civil court is uh, very clear which has held that the work act is not applicable the religious character has to be determined so i am saying that even if these acts are not declared as unconstitutional or this controversy is not decided by the apex court but my suit is maintainable I have evidences to show that the temple was demolished. I have evidences to show that there is a spiritual and historical research in this place. And all these suits of Kashi, Mathura, why to delay it if the Supreme Court decides all these questions after 10 years? First of all, I am not impacted by these two acts. It's a wrong uh, notion in the society that the Places of Worship Act bars such suit. The Places of Worship Act doesn't bar such suit. That controversy has been... Uh, like uh, settled uh, by the district judge of 12th of September and that controversy was also a view was expressed by the Supreme Court while uh, deciding this matter while I just told you the example of Agyari and Cross and the religious character and the controversy of War Fact is also settled when it has been mentioned by the Honorable Supreme Court in 1979 and 2010 that the War Fact does not apply to non uh, non Hindus uh, sorry non Muslims so I need not, those are larger questions which will be decided. But uh, till that time, it is not an embargo to file my cases and uh, my suits. Therefore, I think that I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you, Vishnuji. Uh, just one, uh, one 
um, I mean, I have a doubt about this, uh, what you said. Uh, so if that is the case, let's say if, um, um, you know, if your particular case goes um, uh, against Hindus, right, this could be a case where uh, 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 for the future fights that we have for other temples, this case could uh, be taken as an example to, uh, you know, cancel the other cases. This is the, this is just my agony that I am uh, putting forward. I don't forward. think so. I don't think so. Okay. If this case uh, goes against the Hindus. It's on the particular facts of this case. Na? If whether I have evidences, whether I can prove those evidences in the courts of law, it is on the mm -hmm. basis of evidences that trial will be decided. How the facts of Gyanvyapi case will affect any facts of the case of a temple in Kerala? How the facts of uh, a temple of uh, Bhoshala of Dhar will affect any facts of the case of Mathura? Every case has its own facts and these are the cases which are decided by the trial court. The judgment passed by the trial court is not binding on uh, across the country. It's a uh, it's in that particular set of facts. Okay. Thank you so much, Vishnuji. You have answered all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Disha. Uh, DM. Go uh, uh, Vishnuji, thank you very much for the services to the community, Hindu community, by you and your father. I think Dishaji had uh, probably covered my question. So I'll move myself down. Thank you, DM. Uh, SR Srinivasan. Uh, thank you, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. G. Uh, it's a great honor to be speaking with you, and uh, you know, uh, I definitely know your uh, about your father's uh, cases also. Uh, it's great that you are uh, with us. Uh, one uh, question I have is that uh, you know, uh, the legal team, as lawyers, you have been doing this quite a bit. As a commoner, what is the help that we can do, or if there is any help, what is that that we can do? Sir, uh, you just keep giving your blessings to us and uh, keep blessing the entire community that uh, we can uh, succeed in this legal battle. Uh, to be very uh, frank, uh, that uh, I think uh, the best help can be to educate the people about these topics, to spread the word, to spread the message about our fight. And I think uh, that will be of a very big help. Thank you, Srinivasan, sir. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly move on to the, the remaining two questioners. Uh, Vishnuji uh, also has a time constraint. Uh, Harish, go ahead. All right, thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, sir, I have two questions. One is uh, uh, the, the argument that is kept from the Hindu side uh, frequently is that uh, once a temple is a temple, its uh, nature can never be uh, changed and it will always revert back to that uh, uh, since the beginning of the temple and so and so. But uh, all the judgments that I see have been rendered, uh, uh, they take importance about who was doing what activity in the place post-1947. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, is there any um, new uh, points that uh, the legal teams have come up with? Uh, to persuade the judges to think otherwise uh, because uh, there are so many temples in my state. Uh, Which judgments are you talking about of Supreme Court? And, uh, Supreme Court is uh, even uh, Ram Janmabhoomi. Uh, Ram Janmabhoomi judgment para 116 to 118 is in our favor. Which says that uh, once uh, a temple has been uh, established, uh, the, the vow and the to establish a temple remains eternal. Uh, but uh, much importance is given to uh, what activities carried on post. Sir, your voice is not clear. Uh, can you hear me now, sir? Hello? Yes. Yes, yes uh, but uh, I see judgments giving much importance, even uh, uh, the Gyanwapi case where uh, the maintainability of it was decided. Uh, much yes. importance is given to uh, post uh, that period what was happening in the place. Uh, it's not like uh, 2000 years back it was a temple so uh, doesn't matter if nobody was worshipping yeah, because it. because as of now we are at the initial stage where the plain taverments will be just seen 
when the case will open for evidence then importance will be given to all the evidences which are led by us as of now we have not led our evidence no no that that uh, that i understand sir uh, but my my pr- the principle behind my question is that because in my state there are a lot of alleged temples uh, where currently mosques and uh, churches are sitting but nobody has gone and worshiped them for the past 100 years uh, that's what no... that's what i just clarified that if there is a argument of religious character and if you have uh, pleadings and if you have historical proofs that a temple has been demolished and it has been converted into a mosque so even if you are not worshiping there you can at least file a case for restoration of those places there is no bar because the religious character of that place will never change if it was a temple it will always remain temple's property in gyanvyapi case also let me tell you that in 1991 when suit was filed by mr vijay shankar rastogi and he has not given any pleading like us that we were worshiping in the premises in question till november 1993 and that suit has found favor by the honorable district judge the muslim parties are in appeal before the ilabad high court and it's going on day to day hearing the matter has been uh, recently reserved the judgment has been reserved thank you sir thank you if you could just refer me the page numbers that you mentioned earlier uh, regarding the ayodhya judgment i could uh, refer to para 116 of the ram mandir judgment all right thank where you the, uh, where the uh, concept of idol has been established thank you thank you sir thank you so much uh, thank you harish we will go to the last questioner srijit go ahead uh, hello uh, vishnu ji i uh, hope i am audible yes you are ji uh, okay Uh, sir, uh, Subramanian Swami says uh, we need only three temples. Maybe other temples are important to people. Don't we want it? I never believe or I never second the word of Mr. Subramanian Swami. He can say that uh, he needs only three temples. So first of all, I am not a politician to say that I need a 40,000 temple. I am a lawyer and if I will find proofs and if I will have instructions from my clients, then definitely I will file cases. for restoration of the temples where there is a proof of demolition so it can be the opinion of mr subramaniam swami but i am not here to criticize him or to counter him or to attack him i am here to give my point of view uh, to follow up with uh, what srijitha has asked uh, any community maybe the jain temples or my family temple or anything could be important to people and we can always uh, go and file a file in the court to actually regain them isn't it Yes, definitely. definitely. Absolutely. Vishnu ji, actually, you know, like, like we have discussed, we have come to the end of the session. Uh, it's been great listening to you. And we are very thankful that actually, you know, you came to our uh, room and actually, you know, spent so much time with us. Uh, we pray actually all health and uh, wisdom and everything to you and your father for continuing with the, the fight that you are having. And wish you all the success. Thank you. Thank you. It was very nice interacting with you. Uh, thank you for all the people that uh, were listening to us. Avidya ji, go ahead. No, no, I just wanted to thank Vishnu sir. He's already left. Uh, he had messaged that actually, you know, he has some appointment actually coming up. Uh, that is why I winded up quickly. Anyway, I thank all the people actually who have come up and um, asked the questions as well as those who are listening. Uh, and uh, we can't say how proud we are to have him in our room. Uh, such a barrier uh, for our cause. and i have to mention uh, i couldn't actually tell him directly but i have to mention when i was sharing the uh, this room the, one of the comments that i got was uh, you got the speaker uh, you got the uh, the guest who is actually who is the advocate of our devas there is no bigger honor than that i guess anyway thank you for all of you and uh, truth will always prevail uh, satyameva jayate satyameva jayate